Hey folks, welcome back to Game Geeks. I'm your host, Kurt Weagle. Today's episode, continuing our theme of monstrous, existential, universal, eldritch horror on a beautiful, warm spring day, we are reviewing a set of products for Achtung Cthulhu, which is a World War II setting Call of Cthulhu campaign. Now, we've previously reviewed the main two books in the line, The Investigator's Guide to the Secret War and The Keeper's Guide to the Secret War. The basic premise is this, is that Nazism and Hitler and his cronies have figured out that the mythos is real and they're tapping into it for their own nefarious ends. You play characters on the allied side of the adventure where you are essentially fighting the Nazis because what's more fun than stomping Nazis? and trying to defuse the eldritch horrors before they take over the world and destroy everything. So, there's your basic idea. One of the things I really should note about Octung Cthulhu, especially as compared to games like World War Cthulhu, is it's really set in the pulpy theme or the pulpy side of Call of Cthulhu. I've often described this sort of adventure is much more Indiana Jones versus the Masks of Neolathotep than, say, your typical Call of Cthulhu campaign. One of the other more interesting things about these campaigns is the fact that it is dual-statted for both BRP, or the sixth edition of Call of Cthulhu, and Savage Worlds in the same book. So if you really wanted to, you could run this entire campaign in Savage Worlds and it would work beautifully, which I think is probably a better choice for turning up the dials on the raw adventure and yeah, I could, ease, I could much more easily see punching out Nazis on the wing of a plane while trying to prevent them from summoning a hunting horror than in, in Savage Worlds than I could in Call of Cthulhu, just because of the nature of the two games. Now, what we're talking about today are not the core books themselves. As I said, we reviewed those in the past. Please go back and look at them. I'll be waiting for your return here. You're back. Good to see you again. So now we're going to be talking about two of the location books and then the, I hate to call it a critter book, but it's a bestiary, bestiary, however you want to say it. The two location books we're going to talk about are the Guide to the North African Campaign and the Guide to the Pacific Front. Both of these obviously are, are focused on the locations of different parts of the war that were being fought at that time. Now, both of, these, both of these setting location books give you a timeline of the history of the area through about the early 40s, so for most of the war. Also, historical, geographical, and military information, personages, equipment, locations, etc., for you to run into. Not being much of a World War II buff, and to be perfectly frank with you, not being very interested in playing through the details of a war itself, this was of slightly less interest to me than when you get into the nitty gritty of what's going on with the mystical side of things. Now, before I dive into this, I need to tell you there are two pieces of occultism going on in the Nazi party right now. The first is the, is the Black Sun, which is more of the traditional magic occult, calling down the monstrosities from on high to do stuff for you sort of adventure, what you'd expect from your Call of Cthulhu campaign. Then there's Nachtwolf. Nachtwolf is the let's find practical, scientific, and mechanical applications of the mythos horrors. This is more finding ways to use the supernatural and the Cthulhu mythos to your advantage and to a direct application rather than just impressing people with flash, flashy magic and trying to summon up whatever nasty you're interested in. Now, in the Guide to North Africa, Interestingly enough, I think this focuses a bit more on Nachtwolf. Now, Egypt has long been well-tread in Call of Cthulhu. I think several of the original campaigns, Shadows of yogg Sothoth, Max of Neolothotep, have chapters set in Egypt, where you go there. And let's face it, it's, it's prime area. Lovecraft himself wrote about it quite a bit. There's a story where he actually, that he, shat, that he ghost writes with Harry Houdini, which actually goes under the Sphinx to see critters that are running around under there, etc. 
Now, this, this gets a little bit away from that. You still have some Egyptian-themed stuff, but we're talking about all of North Africa here, not just the, the area around the Nile River. So this actually focuses a bit more on Nachtwolf and what they're doing, and the fact that Rommel kind of got along with Nachtwolf, and they were willing to work, he was willing to work with them because they provided immediate results for what he wanted, rather than Black Sun, which was a bit more... You will work with us, or we will take your soul and feed it to something nasty. Now, I, I kind of like that, because it gives you a different side of this. Sort of like the film Frankenstein's Army, which was a found footage the film. It's kind of icky and jumpy. I don't necessarily recommend it. But most found footage films are a little, really? You wouldn't be running away right now to me. So anyway, this is the North Africa campaign book. I like it a lot. When you get into the Pacific Guide book, the Guide to the Pacific Front, you got to remember when you're dealing with the Pacific Front and you look at the maps, you're getting kind of near really out there. And so you got to tread a little carefully because the big sea himself is slumbering under the water and you want to make sure you don't wake him up. Or do you? Do you want to wake him up? Well, no. But... Another thing that Octung Cthulhu does that I find interesting is it presents you with the options of making devil's bargains. Certain of the more intelligent and aware and less hostile to humanity beings of the Cthulhu mythos can, quite frankly, be negotiated with. It goes through, there's an extremely nice sidebar located in this book, which goes through how, if properly persuaded and paid, Mother Hydra and Father Dagon could become one hell of a force in the Pacific and North Atlantic fronts in the war. Can you imagine a horde of deep ones swarming over a U-boat and dragging it down to the crushing depths? Now imagine that writ large. And all they need are some sacrifices, not necessarily to eat or to like make a bloody mess of, but for breeding stock. I mean, they've got their own agendas, but what else are you going to do with your POWs? It's a nice devil's bargain in there that I kind of like. It's a razor's edge that you don't see a lot in Cthulhu, where it's this very stark yes or no, good and bad, in a lot of campaigns. I also like that, that, that Octung Cthulhu paints everything in shades of gray, but isn't in a race to get to just how dark and nasty it can be. You're still good guys. You're just considering options that are, um, well, not that nice in order to prevent a larger scale massacre. Now, the other thing I absolutely adore about the Pacific Front is it brings to the forefront one of my favorite antagonists in Call of Cthulhu. I won't tell you who, because again, spoilers, but it brings them to the forefront as one of the major players in the Pacific theater during that era. And I absolutely adore how they have adapted to their situation. I think there are several monstrosities in the Cthulhu mythos that don't get used enough. Like if I see one more ghoul or shagoth in your mythos hoedown adventures, I'm going to try not to spit up. But there are a few that I find fascinating. Interestingly enough, many of them are invented by Ramsey Campbell that are more, that have a, a more interesting approach and that you can sort of bargain with, honestly. Now, Terrors of the Secret War. This is the book that is probably going to honk off a lot of Cthulhu purists. And all I have to say to Cthulhu purists is, <laughs> my side. I mean, come on, folks. We're arguing about fictional stuff here. Any artist, inter any intent of interpretation an artist has, he loses control of when it is released. And you have no control and you cannot get grouchy about what other people think of your work. I hold to that. And I'm not sure that Lovecraft would necessarily disagree. Now, the thing that makes The Terrors of the Secret War the most interesting is it presents the monsters and it gives you stats for the monsters, but they tell you right up front, this is not your size 50, this is in 6th edition Call of Cthulhu, your size 50 monstrosity that is there simply to stomp, squish, or otherwise make a fine mist out of you, 
They have, other, they have other ways of getting to you and doing horrible things. It presents you with a very straightforward mass combat system and how a mass combat system can work against some of these terrors of the mythos. So if you really wanted to, you could send a battalion of, you could send a battalion of fleet ships up against Big C himself if someone accidentally woke him up. I'm not saying it would necessarily go well, but you could do it. And let's face it, if one crazy Dutchman can ram a ship into him and make him sink back into the water, think what a couple of battleships have the possibility of doing. You see a bit of a hint of this in Escape from Innsmouth in the last episode where you can actually take the big guns of a battleship and fire them against a star spawn that had been summoned, which I always thought was kind of a cool little thing you get to do. That and take a sub down to the Deep One City off of Devil's Reef and torpedo it into non-existence. So you get stats for some of the bigger monsters. There are a lot represented here. There are, of course, a couple that I would have liked to have seen more on. For example, I'd like to see something on Yig, just because I think Yig would be interesting, because he's one of those that you can sort of, if you play nice, he'll play a bit nicer with you than others. Couple I haven't seen before. A nice interpretation of Cthuga that while I'm not sure if it's original to this book or if it comes from another source, I think it's, I think it's kind of cool. And, and as I said, it is an alternate route into that. Things they can do to you and then things you can do to them to run you off. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler here because I thought that this was, and this is just an example of the level of thought and detail that they put into this, is when you are dealing with Shogner Fawn that when summoned in Asia and Italy, he sort of takes the form of this elephantine thing because elephants are respected, if not revered, in most of Asia, Africa, and Italy. Well, you've still got the memory of Hannibal coming across the Alps at you with those. And then what it can do to you, but the fact that you can damage it if you attack it with a weapon tipped with elephant ivory that has been blessed by a priest of Ganesh. Now that's about as random and obscure and not something your average Cthulhu character would be carrying around in his pocket, but there's nothing that a mythos role can't solve with that. Or some sort of background research that if you think you know what you're fighting, then that's what it is. Now I also present to you that this is Shogner Fawn. This is the piece of art they use to describe Shogner Fawn in this book which, I'm sorry, really not what I normally think of when I think of Elephantine, but if you squint really hard or jab a pen in your eye a few times, you can see it. All of the art in this, particularly the representation of the critters, is really nice. There's a couple of pieces where I'm like, what is that? I, I can't tell. And because they're really dark and hard to see. The one, if you're uh, slightly arachnophobic, I avoid looking at the picture of uh, Atlak Naka simply because I think that will actually cost you a sanity roll if you're arachnophobic. The thing I like about Octon Cthulhu is that it is not afraid to take new routes and new ideas through the, through the application of the Cthulhu mythos into an adventure type setting such as World War II. Another thing that these books present to you is the setting runs from the late 30s into the early 40s, but history can be changed. We can end the physical World War II, but there's no reason that the, most of the Nazi baddies can't flee down into Argentina and into Peronism, and all of a sudden you've got a different front that you have to fight this war on. It's now a lot closer to home, at least for the Americas. There is a very definite European focus to this game, which makes sense. Aside from Pearl Harbor, I don't think America was ever under any real direct threat in World War II, whereas if you were British, it was a completely different story, let alone French. So an alternate approach for Call of Cthulhu, much more pulpy in its application, dual statted for BRP and Savage Worlds. I think it's a very interesting and exciting campaign idea. The one thing I would say is it is loaded with scenario seeds and ways for you to build your own adventures which I think are very exciting, and ways for your characters, your bookish academic, to have a direct effect on the play out of World War II. For Game Geeks, I'm your host, Kurt Weigel. Good day and good gaming.